What's up YouTube? For this video, I thought I'd do a performance breakdown and analysis of how these Ultra Boost 20s perform with fitness and running and exercise. I originally caught these shoes for aesthetic purposes, but kind of diverted more towards the actual running and performance aspect of things, so I thought I'd do a breakdown here. This performance review is going to be a little different in a sense where I'm going to incorporate more of a biomechanical slash movement analysis breakdown of these shoes. So I just want to give a quick disclaimer. I am a very casual runner. I would say I probably put about 50 total miles in these things, which really isn't a lot, but I think it's enough to really have a good first impression. I just did basic workouts in these. I didn't do anything too strenuous or too aggressive or anything like that. So keep that in mind. So when it comes to breaking down running form, we typically like to use two main views. We like to look at the subject from the side and from the back. So let's take a look at the lateral or the side view of myself running first. So as you can see, I'm pretty much a heel striker by habit. Uh, and I'll say right off the bat that by being a heel striker in these shoes, it does have a couple of downsides and disadvantages. So just quickly looking at the rear foot or the back part of this shoe, uh, you can see that in this heel part here, there is this protrusion or posterior angulation on the heel part, which does stick a little bit beyond the Achilles area. This layer of boost is also pretty thick. At least you can see that it gradients towards the forefoot where it's really thick in the back and then it kind of ramps its way downward towards the forefoot here. You would think that this additional layer of boost helps with shock absorption, which it kind of does, but this elevation of the midsole here actually predisposes your foot to be in a little bit more of a plantar flexion angle or position. So the problem with this construction, and again, I'm talking as a heel striker, is gonna cause me to compensate by doing maybe two things. The number one compensation when I run is that it's gonna cause my foot to need to clear farther, which is gonna cause me to strike and make my initial contact to the ground a little higher than what should be normal. So if I use this tool here to measure the moment my heel strikes the ground, uh, it looks like I have an uh, angle of ankle dorsiflexion at about 25 degrees. They say that the normal dorsiflexion should not exceed 20. And so with this being 25, the higher the angle, the more muscle recruitment you are using to technically get that clearance and that stride. The other flaw too is that because I'm excessively dorsiflexing my foot, I'm also feeling like I need to take a little bit of an extra large stride in front of my center of gravity or my center of mass. So the center of mass is pretty much your belly button area or the middle of your trunk. And so you mark where you contact the floor and you draw a straight line down from your center of gravity the farther this distance is from your center of gravity, the also more muscle recruitment you are using through your ankles and uh, which in turn can cause some problems down the road. So this illustration here is gonna demonstrate this, I'm gonna call it a biomechanical flaw. And what I mean by that is uh, with this specific mechanic here, I am pre, I am likely predisposing myself to risk of shin splints given the angulation of my ankle and the uh, amount of load that I'm putting as I slowly accept weight onto that foot. If you imagine that the higher the ankle is off the floor, the more distance your muscle is going to have to work in order to load your body weight onto that leg. And again, if you add that up over time with a lot more miles or steps, then over time, of course, you're overworking the muscle and you're predisposed to things like shin splints. Fortunately for me, I didn't have any problems yet, but again, that's given the fact that I'm training at a very low intensity and a low frequency. So given that my training intensity is low, I'm not at risk or I'm not putting myself in that position where my muscle's quite overworked. All right, now let's turn our attention to the posterior or the back view. When it comes to looking at the back view, the thing I really wanna point out the most, at least with this example, is this right here. There is a sign you should look out for, and it's called the too many toes sign. What that means is that if you're just looking at someone's foot directly from the back as they're putting their foot down or landing on it, what should not happen or what you sh ideally should not see is that more than the pinky toe just kind of peeps out along outside of the side of the ankle and the side of the shin. In my case here, you can see that there would be maybe about the fourth, maybe even a little bit of the third toe kind of peeping out to the side where the foot's basically uh, abducted out to the side a little too much. 
The problem with that is that you're likely over pronating. And when you're over pronating, you're probably putting more strain and more effort on the inner aspect muscles of your foot here. And so when you overload the inside of your foot and pronate over and over and over again, again, given the amount of intensity and duration you're running for, that can predispose you to uh, something called post tib tendonitis, which is basically irritation of the tendon that runs uh, the inside of your ankle. And I guess for me, it doesn't happen all the time, but this step right here is pretty bad. This step right here is pretty bad. So again, right here, you can see a lot of almost like half my foot sticking out to the side there, which is really no bueno. Another flaw that I thought I'd mention, and this is still going along the aspect of the over pronation thing, is that specifically with this pair of shoes right here, I was getting a little bit of a weird friction burn at times. On the medial side of the shoe here, you can see where the prime knit kind of transitions into the neoprene part, but the transition here is actually kind of a hard knot of material right there. And so again, if you're over pronating over and over on that spot, the, the malleolus or the ankle bone inside the foot starts to rub and get burned over time with a little friction. Talking materials too, because the shoe is primarily made of prime knit material, that does suscept you to a little more give or a little more flexibility, which again has its pros and cons. Uh, its con being that your foot is moving a little too much, so you have less stability, more mobility, and over time again, you're basically, um, you're basically jamming your foot or your ankle right there. This is an aspect of maybe I should have tied my shoes even tighter or, or something, but the materials and the over pronation combination uh, might not be great for your skin. So I guess I mentioned a handful of negative things so far about this shoe, but again, this is all given the fact that I am habitually a heel strike runner, so keep that in mind. I actually think that these shoes might do pretty well for you if you are a midfoot or a forefoot striker. The transition from the rear to the forefoot is actually a smooth ride in a sense where I felt like I was having pretty good propulsion. Uh, if I reference my right foot right here, this part where I go from um, what they call mid stance to terminal stance, as I am about to do my heel or toe off here, this part was actually a very comfortable ride in a sense where the transition of the boost was great and because the toe box has good uh, mobility and wiggle room, uh, I felt like it allowed my strides and my propulsion to be very smooth. And honestly, from a comfort standpoint, as a casual wearer of these shoes, they're actually, again, really comfortable because, like, again, it's boost and you just can't complain about that. Just briefly, my opinion on the aesthetic and silhouette of the sneaker, I actually feel like, I, I like how they look, um, but they do give me more of a runner aesthetic, more so than a, a lifestyle aesthetic. Even though I did buy these for aesthetic and lifestyle reasons at first, I actually feel like the more I have them in hand, uh, and as I compare them to the older Boost models, they definitely look more like they're a running shoe than a lifestyle shoe. So that's pretty much my brief analysis, and I, am I supposed to rate them or something? <laughs> If I am, then I guess I would give these shoes like a 2.5, 3 out of 5. Um, for, from running perspective particularly, I think they again gave me some flaws, not on a personal level, but from an analytical level in a sense where you can probably develop problems in these if you had mechanical flaws to begin with already. So uh, uh, definitely consult your local running store or your podiatrist or physical therapist or anyone that specializes in running analysis and uh, definitely talk to them and see what they have to say before really investing in these shoes as your go-to running sneaker. I'll admit that this video is way overdue because I really wanted to do these actually back in like March or April, but that's basically when the pandemic hit and the gyms closed down and I had no access to a treadmill for a long time. So I finally got to hop on a treadmill and do this analysis for you guys. So I really do hope you guys found this review helpful. If you guys are interested in more analytical or biomechanical science-y breakdowns of sneakers like this, please let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear your feedback. My hope is that I can teach you guys just general things to look for when shopping for your next sneaker so that you're able to identify uh, components that might either enhance your performance or diminish and hurt your performance. If you enjoyed this type of video, be sure to check out my two other scientific breakdown videos here and here. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Peace.